chime in. I, as an educator of 30 years, I'd like to share with you some of my reflections on the future of a university education. This is a bicycle wheel. It's a thing of beauty. It's elegant and well thought out design has stood the test of time. The bicycle wheel of today is essentially the same as it was 100 years ago, with a few modifications here and there to account for 21st century materials and 21st century uh, manufacturing techniques. All of the elements of the wheel work together to make, it, to make it function. The rim is attached to the central hub with a set of spokes, and each one of those spokes is important in making that wheel function. The spokes all pull in different directions, but together they keep that wheel round and true so that riding a bicycle is an effortless activity. If you remove some of the spokes of a wheel, it loses its strength and it collapses. What I'd like to do today is use that um, bicycle wheel as a metaphor for a university education. A university education <coughs> consists of many topics in different domains. And those topics stretch us in different directions. But together, they help us understand our world and our communities and help us to solve complex problems that, face, that we face. If we eliminate a lot of those topics and have a very narrow education, the integrity of the system collapses and we can no longer have the suite of tools we need to come up with robust solutions to complex problems that don't fail. So why am I talking about this metaphor? Well, to be quite honest with you, I'm worried. And I think you should be worried too. The societal and political pressures are pushing the university systems of higher education in a direction that's making us talk more about training someone for a job rather than educating a whole person for success in life. The, co the conversation has become one about return on investment, where the investment is the number of dollars you spend for your degree, and the return is the number of dollars you earn over your lifetime. In fact, 67% of the American public say that the top reason to earn an education beyond high school is to get a better job. And 65% say earning mo more money is a reason for, for, for going on for education. And I actually don't dispute that getting a college degree helps you get a better job and helps you earn more money. But what concerns me is that the conversation is not discussing how we should have a broad education so that people have the skills and attitudes and knowledge so they can think about complex problems, about change, about diversity. I think of this as a tug of war, where there are two stakeholders pulling in two different directions. On the one end of the rope are the pressures to reduce the amount of time that we spend in college. In other words, reducing the cost of a university education by reducing the number of classes and limiting it to just those classes you need to get a, a job. And on the other side, you have this um, competing uh, desire to keep a well-rounded education so that people have the opportunity to explore the, the many areas and understand their personal goals and their, and their personal values. Um, at the same time, higher education is being, um, the, the, re the resources in higher education are being reduced. And we're asked to do more with less. And this is causing us to rethink the way we deliver our content. And students have fewer choices and fewer opportunities to experiment with things outside the courses in their major. And it's not that either one of these ways is right or wrong, that there's any right answer to this. I think both sets of stakeholders have the same goal in mind, which is access for students 
and success for students. But as we have to evolve our universities to change, to meet these challenges, I think the important thing is for us to be thoughtful about this so we don't diminish the impact of a truly broad education. Our, our graduates need to have critical, th the critical thinking skills and the breadth to be able to solve the challenges of the future, and even the challenges of today. They need to have the flexibility and the foundation for lifelong learning. After all, when you think about it, the challenges of tomorrow, the jobs to solve the challenges of tomorrow, haven't even been defined yet. And so we need to have graduates who have the skill set so they can continually learn and change, so they can be um, prepared to solve the challenges of tomorrow. The National um, Academy of Engineering has defined 14 grand challenges for the 21st century. And these are challenges that they believe we need to address for our very existence in the future. And as you look at some of these challenges, you can see these require a multidisciplinary approach. These are complex problems. In fact, any kind of complex problem that you're trying to solve requires a multidisciplinary approach. You would need to have uh, the um, mix of economics and technology and policy and to understand the influence of uh, human behavior and culture in order to solve a complex problem. And the many people that would be involved in doing this would have to have the education that gives them depth in their own discipline, but have the breadth to be able to understand the nuances outside their field, and to be able to interact effectively with people who aren't within their own discipline. So what I'd like to do today is convince you that the direction that higher education is going, in which people were, were trying to train people for a much narrower and narrower field, so they get trained for a job rather than educating the whole person, is not the direction that we want to take. And what I'd like to do is use two examples to um, share with you why I think this is important. The first one is um, looking at uh, delivering water. Between 500 and 800 million people worldwide lack access to improved water supply. And when we talk about improved water supply, we're talking about people being having access to 20 liters per day per person within one kilometer of where they live from an improved source. And an improved source is one that is not subject to contamination, particularly by fecal matter. Because when, um, when uh, people are subjected to these pathogens, it causes illness and death. And close to 3.5 million people per year die of waterborne diseases. So if you look at this problem, purely from a technological solution, a sort of narrow technological solution. After all, I am an engineer. Um, you can say, well, I know how to do this. I know how to solve this problem. We know how to make, to, to deliver water to people. We can, we can do this. But it's actually more complex than that. So you might add uh, economics into the equation. There are three possible ways that we could possibly <coughs> deliver this water. One would be a bore well. And a bore well might be a kilometer or two kilometers from where you live. It might serve your whole village or several villages. You could have a standpipe, and the standpipe might be in your neighborhood. So in a village, there might be multiple standpipes. And so you might have to walk three to five blocks to get your water. Or you could have a house tap. Now, you can see the cost of building uh, a house tap is between three to five times greater than building a bore well. So you, if you just looked at economics, you'd say, well, obviously, the solution is we should build bore wells. Because we could use our money most effectively. We could build more bore wells if we didn't have any house tasks. But it's a little bit more complex than that. Let's talk, bring in the human behavior piece. Um, in the left-hand column here, you can see the number of hours that it takes to collect water when you get it from different sources. So if you can get it from your yard tap, it takes you uh, essentially um, one, one day per year. 
But if you have to get it from someplace far away, you're spending 60 to 70 times that amount of time collecting the water. And this means that you're not using that time to work in your garden and tend to your animals, get an education, work on your little family business. So there's a cost associated with spending less money to build these bore wells. If you look at the column on the right, a, a very, another very important human factor comes into play, and that is that water is heavy. And if you have to travel a long way to get that water, you're not going to use as much water because it, it is costly physically for you to go get that water. So if you have to um, go far away, you might use one third as much water than if you have it accessible in your home. Well, if you have very little water, what you're going to do is you're going to use it for drinking and you're going to use it for cooking, but you're not going to use it as much for hygiene. So what happens is people don't wash their hands, they don't stay clean, and this spreads disease. Another way to look at this, this particular graph shows some data that was collected uh, in two places. On the um, one side is the E. coli in a sample collected at the, the public source. And the orange graph shows you this, the same water when it was tested in the home after it was being stored. And you can see that there was 50 times more E. coli in the water that was stored in the home. So what's going on? Well, what's happening is you collect that water at the source in a bucket. You bring a bucket and you, you put it under the source. And that bucket may or may not be clean. But let's just assume that the bucket is clean. So you take the bucket back and you store it in your kitchen. But in order to use it, you have to use a smaller container that you dip in with your hands that you haven't washed because you don't have enough water for hygiene. And then you contaminate the source in your kitchen. And this spreads disease and then people die. So a recent uh, study that was done said that if you decrease the amount of walking time that someone has to walk one way to get their water by 15 minutes, you can, degree, you can decrease the risk of diarrhea by 41%. And the implications for health of a community are enormous. So if you bring the whole picture together and you think about technology and economics and human behavior and policy, you would develop policy that would say, we need to have water that's no more than a certain distance from the home. And you would have some mixture of these different kinds of systems to ensure that in the long run, the least costly solution re involves the, the fewest deaths and the fewest people that are ill. My second example I'd like to share with you it has to do with what happens when your community is completely devastated by a natural disaster. And I'm going to focus on the, um, the, the swarm of earthquakes that occurred in Christchurch in 2010 and 2011. This picture here is a satellite image of um, downtown Christchurch. And you can see that many of the buildings are gone already. And wherever you see a red mark, those buildings are going to be demolished in the next year or so. Essentially, they're wiping the slate clean. There will be no buildings left in the downtown central business district of um, Christchurch. It's going to cost $40 billion to rebuild Christchurch, which is 25% of the GDP of that country. It's going to take a while. Now, coming from a purely technological solution, we know how to solve this. We can build new buildings that are earthquake resistant, and we can completely rebuild Christchurch exactly as it was before the earthquake. So from a technological perspective, this, is, this can be done. However, it's more complex than that. Um, the central business district of Christchurch has been cordoned off since those earthquakes. Nobody has been able to go back into that area, not even to pick up things that were on their desk on the day of the earthquake. So it's like a dead zone. And as a result, businesses have left the city. People have moved away because they don't have any jobs. A, a city that was a vibrant economic capital of New Zealand has now many fewer businesses and a much smaller economic uh, productivity. So in order to resolve this, they came up with a very creative solution. They used uh, shipping containers. New Zealand has a very, very active 
shipping industry. So they took these shipping containers and they created this temporary downtown shopping area called the Restart Mall. And uh, they, they put them together and now you can buy books and you can go for a cup of coffee and you can have gatherings and you can do your shopping. And it's bringing people down into this essentially dead downtown area. In another um, sort of policy related, again, this is a very complex issue. If we just rebuild the city, if we just do the technological solution and rebuild the city exactly as it was, when the next earthquake comes along, we're going to have the exact same outcome. There are actually areas of the city that should not be rebuilt again because the damage due to lack of liquefaction was so great that, um, that the soil, and to improve it, would be too costly. So in terms of policy, the government has decided that there are these red zones where they're never going to build again. And they've bought all the homes from the people who live in these areas, and they're turning these into green spaces and public spaces that will be available to the public, and they've moved those people to other parts of the city. And in a, um, and in a final uh, sort of really broad picture, one of the really exciting things about rebuilding this community is that the government has decided to do some social engineering to right a previous wrong. When Christchurch was developed and expanded, the Maori people were moved to the extremities of the city, to the most marginal land. And as a result, in the earthquake, they were most badly affected by the earthquake. So what they're doing is they're now collaborating with the Maori people to bring Maori cultural facilities back into the city, to celebrate the, the Maori culture, to embrace this culture and right something that was wronged many, many years ago. So it shows you that you can take a problem and do a very simple, narrow perspective, and you're not really going to solve the problem. But if you bring in all these other perspectives, you can have a wonderful solution. So in closing, what I'd like to say is we really need to resist the trend in higher education to move to a very narrow focus where we're training someone for a job. But instead, we want to make sure that we have this model of education where we're pulling in all these different disciplines and we're educating our students for a future so that they're capable of solving these very complex problems. Thank you.